Hello, welcome, welcome to Catalyst. Uh, my name is Alicia Hansel. I work at Archaeology Southwest, and I just want a quick show of hands. Who has been to the Archaeology Cafe in the original location, Casa Vicente? Oh, look around. You guys are the OGs. That is impressive. So, without further ado, I'm going to have Steve come up, but thank you so, so much for coming to this event. Let's hear it for Archaeology Cafe and Catalyst. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, folks, I'm Steve Nash. I'm President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest, and I'm thrilled to welcome you into the Catalyst event space, artistic space. I don't even know how to describe this space. Um, it is wonderful to be here. We've been here since about 4 o'clock, and we're seeing kids taking music lessons and art lessons and other kinds of things, doing their homework here. It's multicultural, multi-generational. It's awesome, and there's a ton of parking out there. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you all for making the trip. I've, met, uh, I've seen some old friends here. I've also met some new folks. There are people who are going to solve the world of tree ring dating in Bhutan here. There are people who came from Silver City just for this lecture. So thank you, thank you for being willing, indeed, give my hand, uh, for being willing to come back together to do things. This presentation is gonna be released in high quality video uh, by our vi videographer, Victoria, right back there. And so people who couldn't make it tonight will have a chance to see this. But you all know Zoom, we've all got Zoom fatigue. We wanted to put together an event for you in which we broke bread together. We um, ate, we drank, we shook hands, we did all of those kinds of things that we all know and loved before the pandemic. So thank you, thank you for being here. So before I introduce our speaker tonight, I wanna give the microphone to Kevin Larkin, the proprietor of Catalyst? What, what should we call it? The manager of Catalyst, who's the juggler of Catalyst, who's gonna tell us about this place. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we're very excited to have Archaeology Southwest here in Catalyst today. My name is Kevin Larkin. I manage Catalyst Creative Collective here, run by the Southern Arizona Arts and Culture Alliance. Has anybody been to a Southern Arizona Arts and Culture Alliance event? Saka, all right. So if you have any questions about the space or if you want a little tour, just come see me after this is done. Um, just want to point out a few things. Uh, Emily from Humble Board made all your food tonight. She is one of our main partners here, preparing food in this space. Um, you'll also see some kids running around. We host music lessons for the community here through a nonprofit called Tucson Youth Music. If you want to find out more about them or support them, check them out at tucsonyouthmusic.org. And I want to introduce you to Angela Burton with Art Mixer. That's another one of our main partners over here. She does paint, drop-in painting classes. So as you can see, Every day is um, very exciting here. Lots of different partners in and out of the space, but we are thrilled to have you all present about dogs and yeah, very excited. Also kudos to the Tucson Mall for allowing dogs, huh? Thanks. All right, um, thank you, Kevin. The internet did many wonderful things for society, but it killed the art of the good introduction because you can get more information on speakers just by Googling the name uh, and getting all the, the details on people. And, and Ari is like, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, can't do that. So what I like to do is find out some tidbits about people that you other, otherwise might not have known. So Ari Barillo is our speaker tonight. He's an archeologist with the Bureau of Land Management, uh, went to Northern Arizona University and then the University of Utah, um, has published two books uh, in his young career, uh, one behind the bear's ears, the definitive tome on the archeology span of bear's ears, yeah. It's in its second printing, it came out in 2020. It's second printing, that doesn't happen. <laughs> and then The Backwoods of Everywhere, which is a memoir by a guy who's too young to publish a memoir, <laughs> right? Um, but he got his start, interestingly, in archeology. span He's from upstate New York in a micro city that he hated, quote unquote. <laughs> And he came to the Southwest and met somebody that we all know and love, Bill Leip, met him in Flagstaff and said, Bill, I wanna be a Southwestern archeologist, what should I do? And Bill said, you need to go to the State University of New York at Binghamton. <laughs> and, and Ari said, no. Uh, but the man is tough as a badger. He had Lyme disease for four years and beat Lyme disease. How cool is that? 
Congratulations, and he gave me permission to share that with you. Uh, what else? Dogs and archaeology. This theme, this issue of our magazine is going to be coming out soon. Uh, this whole thing is your idea and your brainchild. So we are thrilled to have Ari Barillo here to introduce us to Dogs and Archaeology, the inaugural uh, archaeology, archaeology cafe here at Catalyst. Thank you all so, so much for coming. Food and drink is going to be available after the lecture. Our goal is to send you all home at about 2 o'clock this morning, right? <laughs> Anyway, Ari, take it away. Thank you, Steve. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Um, I will be talking about these dogs here, uh, but just to sort of tee things up real quick, a little bit about the, uh, the quote unquote author here, me. Um, bouncing off what Steve already said, I started out as a bartender in New Orleans, which was fun. Um, and then gradually pivoted into a career in archaeology. I was a uh, quote unquote academic for about eight years. Uh, before that, I worked in the private sector, or the, sorry, the public sector for about eight years in Bears Ears and in Glen Canyon. And I, I tend to go in these eight year cycles. So I've been here in Tucson for a year working for the Tucson field office. We'll see what happens in seven years. Um, but what I really am is a public scholar. And that's the reason that I like working so much with Archaeology Southwest is I'm a very big believer in public scholarship and, and, and really stepping outside of the, strictly speaking, the halls of academe and, and getting out you know, to the people and bringing this information to folks that I think would be interested in it that might not have access to or have any interest in those sort of high-minded academic sort of journals. And I mention that now because I'm gonna come back to that theme over and over and over. But as for my interest in, uh, in these fellas here, full disclosure, um, wolves are probably my favorite animal. Um, I say that as a human scientist and I'm not gonna walk it back. Uh, but I, if I didn't end up as an archeologist, I probably would have been a wolf biologist, but you can't really study the ecology of wolves, especially in the West. Uh, without rubbing shoulders with these fellows at some point. This is a, a photo that I borrowed from the nonprofit Wolf Education Center or Conservation Center. But you also can't really study archaeology, especially in the West, without at some point rubbing shoulders uh, with coyotes. They come up over and over and over again for very good reason. And when you start to get into the study of dogs, uh, one of the things that you find, and this is the other theme, the other topic that's going to come up over and over again tonight, is that the the delineation, the, the, the line, the hard and fast boundary that we draw between pets on the one hand and pests on the other hand, the closer you look, it gets a little fuzzier. And when you start looking at that boundary from other cultural perspectives, especially indigenous perspectives, oftentimes it disappears entirely. And so with that in mind, let's start with chatting uh, just a little bit about coyotes themselves. Um, I'm not gonna dwell over much on this, uh, but just a bit of the, uh, the ecology of these creatures. There are at least 19 subspecies known in North America. They come from an older lineage of Canis, uh, older even than the gray wolf. Um, and they, you know, modern coyotes arose during the Middle Pleistocene period, or what we call the Middle Ice Age period, and started out more, much more variation than they have now. Sort of like with corn, that variation got reduced over time. And following this, they evolved to be supremely adaptable instead of being prey specialists. Um, rather like us, in fact, and that's part of the reason that I, I find that I have so much affinity with these creatures the more and more I study them, because we, uh, we are of the, the lineage Homo and the family Homididae, uh, which includes the other great apes, the gorillas, the orangs, the chimps. Uh, but unlike them, we are, we are the least specialized and therefore the most adaptable. You know, gorillas have to live in, in, in high mountainous jungle areas or they, they don't really do very well. Uh, whereas we can live to a certain extent just about anywhere. We live in a place here where it was 104 degrees on October 1st of 2024, if I remember correctly. And, and still we're here. And coyotes are like that. They're, uh, they're obligate adaptationists. That's their primary specialization if you could call it that as adaptation. And the advantages of this, I hardly need to explain here. Um, but among their adaptations is the fact that they are known as a, a sort of an urban or an urbanized species. Um, I, for example, I lived 
For better or for worse, I lived in Phoenix before moving here. I lived in a, a neighborhood in Scottsdale. I lived in a neighborhood in North Phoenix. And I have now lived in, uh, in Tucson for a year. And I ride my bike around a lot. And in every, and I'm not exaggerating, literally every single neighborhood where I have, have walked or ridden my bike or lived in Phoenix or Tucson, I've seen coyotes. Every single one, which is why my cats don't go outside. And this phenomenon, first and foremost, getting into the history of, uh, of our understanding of these animals, this concept of urban coyotes is not new. The word coyote comes from, I'm going to screw this up, but approximately cautu, uh, which is an Aztec or a Nahuatl term. And uh, the Aztecs, the members of the Aztec Empire, the Mixtecs, technically had, uh, you can see in the archaeological record, I'll show you an example of that later on. You can see how much they, they thought about these animals and how much they articulated to them. But they also named parts of the city of Tenochtitlan after how many coyotes you could find there. So this was like the avenue of coyotes. And over here was like this square was called the place of coyotes in Nahuatl. And I cannot pronounce it, so, you know, but it means place of coyotes. And it makes sense the Aztecs in particular were fascinated by, by hunting creatures. Um, and these were creatures that hunted their streets. And that was especially fascinating for them. And so it kick-started uh, a focus on coyotes in, in at least the Aztec world going all the way through to this day. Same thing if you go to New Mexico, same thing with um, this place, Chaco Canyon, which is about as urbanized as the greater northwest, or uh, sorry, the, the, the northern or greater southwest in the United States became outside of the, you know, the megalopolises of the whole camp. And we find coyotes there too that, that were not interred so much as just sort of found within the city centers and places like Pueblo Benito. So this, this concept of a supremely adaptable urban coyote that sees and takes advantage of whatever environment is in front of it is something that folks have understood about them all along. And it's something that I appreciate them about, about them tremendously. And then Europeans got here. First Europeans to encounter coyotes had no idea what to think about them. Uh, Josiah Gregg is a, a famous explorer, trapper, etc. Uh, kind of a buffoon and a self-aggrandizer, but Gregg referred to them as, quote, prairie wolves. Others called them American jackals, which they are not. They're also not wolves. Uh, Lewis and Clark, I think it was Lewis specifically, shot one on their expedition. They referred to them as prairie wolves, because spelling was, is a malleable thing. And an artist, now we're moving into the 1800s, an artist named Titian Ramsey Peel drew what is considered to be the first known painting, at least Western style painting, of a coyote, which he misidentified as a sort of weird, big, barking fox. <laughs> so we didn't really know what to think about him, but like folks were always fascinated by them. And, and that, that was a theme that I wish had continued, but it started to change, unfortunately. Um, it, writing and roughing it. Mark Twain uh, it, described them as, he described them as wily, he described them as humorous, which is another big topic that'll come up again tonight. Um, and he, he seemed to admire the fact that they were so clever and so wily and, and humorous and so on and so forth, but he didn't admire them. Uh, he described them almost the way that you would describe, uh, describe a, a small statured, but nonetheless very devilish imp. And later on, he went on to uh, describe them this way, that the coyote, again, spelling is a moving target. But the coyote is a long, slim, sick and sorry looking skeleton with a gray wolf skin stretched over it, a tolerable bushy tail that forever sags down with a despairing expression of forsakenness and misery, a furt of an evil eye and a long, sharp face with a slightly lifted lip and exposed teeth. He has a general slinking expression all over. The coyote is a living, breathing allegory of want. So not overly flattering. And by the time you get into or start heading into the, you know, the modern sort of industrial era with urbanization on the coasts and with the complete and utter takeover of open spaces in the West by cows, you start getting just full-fledged animosity toward these animals. And so in 1920, in an article in Scientific American, uh, it is noted that coyotes are not worth the price of ammunition it costs to shoot them. 
And they are described as the ultimate, in that article, ultimately described as the ultimate Bolshevik, <laughs> which is weird. <laughs> Bolsheviks, for those of you who don't know your Russian history, uh, they were the, the, the winners of the Russian Revolution. They are communists, so coyotes are communists. And, and that's bad. <laughs> and it just took off from there. And so you reach a state that we're in right now where coyotes are probably, at least by a number of metrics, the most persecuted native carnivore in North America today. Um, there's a fantastic book by Dan Flores called Coyote America, where I got some of the facts and figures from the slide before. A lot of them I'm going to show you now comes from Project Coyote. Um, and just as a trigger warning, because there's kids, the next couple slides are a little hard to watch if, uh, if you love animals or are not a horrible human being, but I promise they're not too grisly. Uh, but these are some of the figures, or some, some of the, uh, yeah, the figures, the mathematical figures. So the U.S. Wildlife Service alone, uh, underneath the Department of Agriculture, kills at least 64,000 of the literally hundreds of thousands of coyotes killed every single year. And here are some of the ways that it's done. Bounties, poisoning, aerial gunning, leg hold trapping, snaring, calling and shooting, hound hunting, killing contests, and denning. And that's where they find the dens and either poison them, sometimes even blow them up. And just breaking those facts down a little quicker, uh, or a little more detailed, these are the, the percentages that are aerial gun, trapped, poisoned, and shot. And this in particular, I think it's technically illegal at this point to use poison guns, like bait trap poison guns. Uh, people still do it, and they are indiscriminate because they're machines and they don't think. So they take out dogs, they take out wild cats, domesticated cats, human beings step on them sometimes. It is a, a ridiculous and horrible situation. So we've created this, this situation where we've, we've come to identify them culturally as an enemy. And they're an enemy to be stomped out. And there's a lesson in that and it's not the lesson you might think. So from the nonprofit Project Coyote, I'll just read this out so you don't have to. Maligning stereotypes and fallacies follow coyotes wherever they go. Unlike many predators who face extinction, coyotes continue to survive and thrive in the face of persecution. Their survival is attributed to their intelligence, adaptability, and resilience, traits many Native Americans revered in the coyote as the trickster. And the way that works in particular is this. One of my absolute favorite uh, little evolutionary traits, I think it's unique to coyotes, uh, but as a communal species, that yip, that song, in other words, that coyotes do, actually acts as a sort of census. They're sending out, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, and then others are going, I'm here too, yeah, me over here. And if they don't hear enough, it triggers an autonomic response that results in them ramping up the size of their litter and also uh, quickening the speed at which their litters happen. And here's a, isn't that awesome? And here's a, uh, a graphic that I just sort of borrowed whole cloth from Project Coyote. So here you can see at stability, a typical family here, the two alphas produce a litter about this size. Here it results in these, you know, adults and stuff. And then somebody comes along with their poison and their lack of morals and they kill a bunch of them. All these solo coyotes find each other using this, hey, where are you? And they end up producing much more quickly litters of about twice the size. So if you count how many are here and you count how many are here, that's how lethal control works. So the upshot of all this is that uh, due to a, 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 a wonderful, a delightful quirk of evolution, a century, over a century, of trying to wipe these animals out entirely has resulted in more coyotes than ever. And I, I feel like I'm not alone in saying, that's a pretty good trick. <laughs> pretty good trick. And uh, by the way, before I go on, I just want to give credit for this too. This is because I love this drawing. Um, this is by a woman named Julie Buffalohead of the, uh, the Ponca tribe in Minnesota. But it's for reasons like that, that they're regarded as, as sort of the penultimate tricksters. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stand up here and tell any coyote stories. Um, I have not, I've not been given any to tell, and I'm, I'm a white guy, I don't like to represent others' culture. If anyone else wants to share any, it'd be great. 
Uh, but I will do, what I will do instead in the role of scientific journalist is just sort of present overviews. But this is a sample of some of the indigenous tribes in North America that have coyote as a, a trickster figure in their cultural narratives. This is some, some of them. But what I will drill down on is the topic of humor. And the reason, and the reason for that is because humor in science and especially, I don't know how to approach this without getting angry, but humor in, in Native American cultures through the lens of, of mainstream culture just doesn't really appear. And, and that's always bothered me, especially as when I was a student, when I was this big up in Flagstaff, tending bar and then going to school. I remember this, uh, this Diné cat that I went to school with would say, you know, it's, it's just, they talk about it's this is sacred and that's sacred and this is how they survive and they have this and that stuff. Uh, but the, the humor never pops up. And it really doesn't in mainstream culture until basically like, what, three, four years ago with reservation dogs and now it's, it's starting to make its way out there. But typically in the history of American mainstream depictions of Native Americans and their beliefs, their stories, including ones like Coyote, the two choices were A, bloodthirsty savage, or B, you know, stoic steward of the land and ecologist and nary the twain shall meet. Uh, when in fact humor was, was and remains extremely important to these groups. This is a, uh, a quote from Standing Rock Sioux author or Lakota author Vine Deloria Jr. in the wonderfully titled book, Custer Died for Your Sins, in which he says, laughter encompasses the limits of the soul. In humor, life is redefined and accepted. Irony and satire provide much keener insights into a group's collective psyche and value than do years of research. In other words, humor is and has always been extremely important to imp indigenous peoples of North America. And given things like their ability to respond to attempted genocide by increasing their numbers to the point where there are now more than ever, coyotes obviously fit that bill. They, uh, they, they, they slot into a role like that probably better than any others. And we used to have this too in Western culture. We used to have uh, you know, the, the jester, the joker back, especially during this era. Probably the best example of this I can think of comes from the lines in Richard II by Shakespeare when he says, within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of the king keeps death his watch and there the antic or the court fool sits grinning at his state and scoffing at his pomp. And then ultimately comes death with a little pin bores through his mighty castle walls and farewell king. And the point of that was that the jester, more than just entertaining, more than just providing distraction and recreation was to remind people of their humanity and their finitude. And the Romans did this too. Whenever they'd have a triumph, there'd be the general out in front, usually pushing some you know, conquered matriarch or patriarch or somebody. It's what they were gonna do to Cleopatra, but she found a, an easier way out. And there would be somebody walking right beside him going, you know, you're gonna die someday too, right? You know, you're gonna die someday too. You know? You're not immortal either, right? But we've kind of lost this in Western culture. And I think probably my favorite summarization of that is from a, a work by famed uh, psychologist Abraham Maslow, the guy who made the, you know, the Pyramid of Needs. You may be familiar with that. When he studied in his book Motivation and Personality, he, he sort of canvassed the field of, of psychology and came to the conclusion that American culture was, in his mind, as a result of our sort of puritanical roots, over pragmatic, over Puritan and over purposeful. And he said in that regard, we are missing out on one half and perhaps even the most important half of life. And so we've largely done away with this, this role. And it's a very important one. It's one that I'm gonna bring this, this little tangent on humor to a close, but um, it's one that we would do well to bring back. And in the words of John Fire Lame Deer is another Standing Rock Lakota, uh, all clowns are sacred. This was a part of a speech that he gave to, or, or a uh, part of testimony, I should say, that he gave to an anthropologist. And there's more to that quote. I'm not going to go in it now, uh, into it now, but he talked about Iktome and Coyote, both, uh, as being sacred teachers of the fact that, in his words, people who have a lot to cry about, such as us Native Americans, have learned that we need laughter 
as well as we need everything else, other tools to survive. And when I look around the world today, that seems like a really useful lesson. And the reason I mention all this uh, is because of the role that coyotes in particular play culturally. So we're gonna start getting now into the archeology span and where this articulates with not only the archeology span of, of human beings in North and South, uh, Central America, I should say Mesoamerica, but also dogs. So I mentioned earlier the Aztecs, uh, that they had a thing for coyotes. I don't know what this coyote is doing here, but I, I know he's up to no good. <laughs> and that you can just, again, it's, you know, we always, there's a joke among archeologists, if we don't know what it means, it's ritual. <laughs> Whatever, what's this, it's a ritual object. Well, this may be a ritual object, but it's clearly not meant to be taken too seriously, right? Like, I feel like we can say that. Um, Another example, one of my favorite examples of coyotes in archaeology, this is a photo that was taken by my good friend Jonathan Bailey, who also took the cover photo for my book, which was the photo for the talk, the coyote cocking its ear. That photo was actually taken from the passenger seat of my car. Uh, but this is a, a panel called Coyote Places the Stars, located up in the Tavaputs Plateau. This is his photo, because it's artsy and he's better than me. Um, this is my photo, a little more straight on. But it's, it recounts some version of a story that pops up in various ways. Coyote places the stars, or coyote spills the stars. Uh, in one, coyote puts them into the, the constellations and stuff as a way to entertain himself, because he's bored. In another one, coyote has been asked by one, you know, figure to carry a bag of something across the landscape and drop it somewhere else. And because he's coyote, he has to look inside and see what it is, and it's stars, and they spill all over the place. And it is seeing the physical representation of those stories that have this living memory that people still tell this story about coyote and the stars, that is hundreds, if not thousands of years old, these, these uh, petroglyphs. And here's another one that I think, I don't know for sure, but I think this is a, at least a version of the same thing. This one's located closer to Moab. Uh, and again, you've got the, you know, what did you call it? The, the, the sad, forlorn, sagging tail. That, that looks pretty lively to me. I don't know what Twain's problem was, but, uh, but these stars as well, sort of following him along. And so the reason, I, again, that I show these is that the story of Coyote either placing or spilling the stars uh, are great examples of the importance of not only of Coyote with a capital C and Coyotes in their culture, but also the importance of humor. Because those sort of lessons, you're supposed to kind of giggle at it. Coyote, uh, they never, I'll just say it like this, they never crucified Coyote. Because we had a trickster in our culture that had some pretty good tricks too. He could walk on water, he could make loaves and stuff appear. Uh, but Coyote, you're supposed to laugh at him. And even when he does horrible things and he you know, ends up taking his own life and stuff, it's, it's a way to, to sort of anchor those lessons in and carry them with you. The teachers that you remember best from high school, from college, the ones that told the, the jokes, the ones that made you laugh, they're the ones that stay with you the longest. And so getting back, into, uh, getting back into the topic of coyotes themselves, latrins means barking. Canis latrins is barking wolf. Again, they, the, um, as far as we know, domesticated dogs, also part of the Canis lineage, it was thought for a long time that, that domesticated dogs are descended from wolves. Um, specifically, I think a lot of researchers for a long time thought they were descended from gray wolves. They're not, it turns out, they share a common ancestor, and so do coyotes. But the, the relevance of the, the, the bit about humor, the relevance about the bit about cultural narratives of coyote to this, this topic here, dogs versus coyotes, is again in that boundary that I talked about, that hard and fast, this one is domesticated, we like them, they're friends, this one is undomesticated, we don't like them, they're terrorists. And it's not, it's not always like that. And the pre, uh, anyway, the uh, pre-Columbian populations of dogs were replaced mainly by dogs brought by Europeans, but the story gets a bit fuzzier when you dig into the archeology, span especially with regard to coyotes. And this brings us to uh, a type site. 
in the archaeology of the topic that I've presented tonight, and that is Arroyo Hondo, or Hondo. Hondo, Hondo, I don't speak Spanish. I used to speak Spanish. And if you don't use it, you lose it, so I no longer speak Spanish. It is a very large Pueblo settlement located just south of Santa Fe. I actually had a friend here from Santa Fe, so good on you. It was enormous, at least a thousand rooms, and it comprised an area of some 12 acres, and it was occupied right up until about 1425. It is one of the most extensively studied pre-contact settlements in all of the greater Southwest. It looks like this now, and it looked approximately like this when it was in full, uh, full swing. And a relatively, uh, among those studies, a relatively recent study that was carried out uh, within the last five years by a Dr. Monaco and her colleagues explores the relationship between dogs and coyotes in the archeological and uh, more broadly the cultural record in a paper called What Makes a Dog Exploring um, or Stable Isotope Analysis in Human Candid Relationships. And at Arroyo Hondo, there were coyote remains in locations that suggest coyotes played a role in Pueblo life. Uh, both when they were alive and in the, in the afterlife. And the results indicate that in some cases, coyotes seem to have been treated like dogs and another seem to have been treated like their wild relatives. And to dig in that a little, just a little bit deeper, I'm gonna read this quote from their paper and then I'll show you some of their, uh, some of their figures. It's pertinent to note, first of all, you use stable isotopes to reconstruct diet, so we can't see what they were doing, but we can see what they were eating, how they were treated, where they were buried, and kind of put it together from there. The Arroyo Hondo kind of suggests a just juncture between archaeological definitions of domestication and how ancestral Puebloans considered dogs. In some of the specimens we tested, dogs match archaeological expectations for dogs, but in others, coyotes seem to have been treated like dogs. And in yet others, genetically domestic dogs seem to have, been eat, uh, seem to have eaten more like coyotes or wolves. In addition, the burial locations of the canons examined here suggest an afterlife role for all of these individuals. So, this is what their scatter plot looks like. I could go into it, but it's, you don't wanna hear all that. Um, stable nitrogen isotopes on the left, stable car uh, carbon isotopes on the right. You apply that to these paleo dietary models, you can see what these creatures were eating. And what they concluded was that these specimens in particular, these two, that there is precedent elsewhere in North America, specifically in the Great Basin, uh, as well as the Pacific Northwest, where coyotes were probably captured as puppies, they were tamed, um, and they were raised you know, in the community. And if Arondo Hondoans, Arroyo Hondoans, if the occupants of Arroyo Hondo uh, kept coyotes as dogs, or at least treated them that way, tamed them that way, we would expect them to, that we would expect the resulting dietary reconstruction to look like dogs, and that's exactly what we get from at least two of these individuals. And why this is especially fascinating, especially to me, is because of ongoing studies looking at differentiation between, uh, between dogs and coyotes and other canids in the archeological record. The baseline assumption has always been, again, it's that, you know, that perspective I keep coming back to, that these are pests, these are pets, and ne'er the twain shall meet. And uh, while a coyote, you know, so if you find a dog buried at a site, that was a friend. If you find a coyote buried at a site, that was a pest or a varmint. It was probably killed or whatever. Um, but the results from Oyo Hondo suggest the story might not be that simple after all. I would say statistically, in most cases, that's still true. Um, but not always. Not always. And it, it invites us to re-examine some of these these, again, these boundaries, these delineations that we've come to, to rely upon in life the way that we do. And to bring, that particular, <laughs> to bring that particular topic to a close, first of all, this is a, a dog that I photographed on the Navajo Nation eating corn on the cob, <laughs> which just, again, they're, just, they're, they're more human than even some of the people I know. Uh, but, <laughs> Uh, but I just want to take this moment to wrap it up, you know, a talk on coyotes specifically by emphasizing how these hard and fast lines we draw between pets and pests in Western culture, like so many other hard and fast lines that we draw, are, uh, they're, they're open to debate. And, and, and they are in need of being looked at differently or under a different light. Uh, we, we draw hard lines between the sacred and the profane. We draw hard lines between the fun and the professional. Um, I've had papers rejected from 
august and austere academic journals because my, my style is too informal, because I talk like a human being. And, you know, and it was suggested, well, just strip all the humanity out of it and make it as dry as, as bones in the desert, and then we'll accept it. And what I often do instead is this, you know, bring it, bring it to the people, the people that are going to uh, enjoy it the most. And, you know, throw some jokes in there, man. Like, I don't, I don't think those boundaries help us. And the lesson that we learn from coyotes, especially, especially the lesson we learn from coyotes, is that unlike with dogs, we have identified them as enemies in American culture for at least 100 years. And we have hammered so hard on that line that they're enemies and that they must be eradicated because they're a problem, that we have made the problem bigger than ever. Which again is the ultimate trick. So good on you coyotes. Uh, but it suggests we really need to re-examine some of those lines. As for the subject of today's talk, there's a whole interesting other discussion that can, uh, can and is indeed happening um, in other circles. What exactly does it mean to be domesticated? Typically that's taken to mean uh, dependence, usually through selective breeding, sometimes genetic manipulation, but you, you, you take something and change it so much that now it's dependent. Corn can't grow without us, for example. Cows can't survive at least very well without us. Uh, chickens, I think the ones that often end up in buckets at KFC can't even fly anymore. That's full domestication. So are dogs domesticated? Are cats domesticated? They can get by just fine without us. Ask Australia. <laughs> and so all these boundaries are a bit fuzzy and I just want to invite you at the start of this, this series of talks on dogs and especially on dogs as they appear in cultures that aren't aren't ours, speaking as a white guy, not Western cultures. Um, the way that people think about them and articulate with them, it's, it's not always the same. It's not the same across boundaries. It's not the same across you know, cultures, geographic boundaries, languages, and so on. And approaching things like that, it's always best to keep an open mind and to never lose your humor, especially when you're dealing with dogs. Well, with that in mind, the <laughs> if anybody gets that, reference, by the way, I'll buy you a drink. The forthcoming lecture series we are going to be discussing, uh, well, I'll get into what we're discussing in a minute, but we're actually, we're expanding in this issue on an existing issue. 2008 was the uh, Dogs in the Southwest, Dogs in Southwest Archaeology, um, and it focused almost exclusively on the Southwest, and it focused almost exclusively on archaeology, and for good reason. The word archaeology is right there in the title. Um, but what we're trying to do with this one is we're expanding that to be dogs in the Americas. We're going to include uh, topics from all over North America, uh, as well as throughout time from obviously archaeology going way, way back, tens, maybe more than 10,000 years, right up to nearly to the present. Uh, we just, just received a fantastic piece on dogs in, at Hopi yesterday. Um, one from the Richard Begay at the Navajo Nation Historic Preservation Department on dogs and Navajo culture. Got one on historic dogs, helping explorers in Glen Canyon, all sorts of stuff. So uh, we've even got, and now I'm going to get into the talks a little bit, we've got Dr. Audrey Lynn coming all the way down from the Pacific Northwest. And she'll be talking about these fellas here. These are Salish woolly dogs, a uh, good source of heat. Uh, if you ever heard the term three dog night, that literally refers to a night so cold that you're going to use three living blankets to keep you. I'm not kidding. That's these big woolly dogs. They were living blankets. You invite two of them in if it's not that cold. But a three dog night, that's yeah. Anyway, next up, uh, actually next month, my good friend, Dr. Lori Webster is going to be talking about this is uh, these are dog hair yarn from White Dog Cave. Uh, Basket Maker 2 Cave in the Bears Ears area. Lori's going to be talking about dogs and textiles and dog hair and how that comes about in, in archaeology, and it's going to be kind of cool. We've also got Dr. Martin Welker is going to be talking about, I'm going to try to tee this up right, sled dogs in the Southwest? Question mark? <laughs> I am, it's a fascinating topic. I, I like his writing, and I, I can't wait to hear about that one. We've got Dr. Matt Hill coming in, who's gonna be talking about the sort of the collision between 
Europeans and Africans, enslaved Africans and indigenous people and their respective dogs, where they all sort of come together in these, these port communities in the Northeast. Um, that's what this one refers to. And last but not least, uh, Brandy Bethke, uh, like Martin Welker, is also a, a local here in Tucson, is going to be coming back to cover basically everything else. So uh, uh, kind of an overview up to date, you know, what's going on today in dog zooarchaeology. And that'll be the last talk on April Fool's Day. So if you show up to that, actually we're recording this and I don't, never mind Brandy, we're not going to do anything on, <laughs> it'll be perfectly professional and you can always trust me when I say that. So that's a brief snapshot of what's to come. And this has been one of the more concise talks I have. I guess it's only about 40 minutes that I've been yammering at you. But yeah, so that's what I've got to say. I would also actually, before we go on to like questions and discussion and that stuff, I'd also like to add um, uh, about the venue. I mentioned already, I've got a friend visiting me from Santa Fe. We went to the loft last night for their Mondo Monday when they show really terrible movies on Monday nights there and it's a big local thing, a lot of people show up. And they're supposedly they're still open during this renovation they're doing, which I know a lot of people have asked questions like, well, if they're still open during renovation, why are we doing this here? So we showed up last night to watch this film about I think animatronic cats that kill a bunch of people or some, <laughs> some horrible thing. Uh, and they turned everyone away at the door Notice was so quick, they couldn't even send out an email. We all showed up and they went, no, no, you gotta go. I think during the uh, renovation, someone cut or broke like a gas line. So we walked away going, yeah, this was probably a really good idea coming here. But I also wanted to mention, um, obviously there's food in the back, there's drinks in the back. If you wanna stick around later than that, one of my favorite bars in, in the entire world is a speakeasy located behind, literally behind a wall in the back of the game store upstairs called the Short Rest Tavern. It's very Dungeons and Dragons themed. Um, I told them all about this talk series, so they're gonna, they're advertising for us. They're gonna hopefully send some folks down here. And if you would like, uh, I will probably head up there after, after we're all done here, if you wanna have a chat in person, uh, because I, I really love them. Anyway. Okay. Thank you so much. Ari, let's hear it again. So I will be walking around uh, to take any questions that you may have. I really like your humor. Would you consider two chihuahuas and a pug a three dog night? <laughs> Two chihuahuas and a pug, is that enough? In would Tucson, you... yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would keep your feet warm. Two, two chihuahuas and a pug might be a bit much in Tucson, <laughs> actually. Too. You'll get roasted out of your bed. Other questions? You talked about the, the lack of barriers between coyotes and domestic dogs, but you did not talk about hybridization between coyotes and domestic dogs and between dogs and wild wolves. And so could you speak to that? Of course, of course they hybridize readily and the back crosses between the, the dogs and the coyotes to the hybrids occurs. And so there's these hybrid swarms of canis in North America. Yeah, yeah, so the, um, there's a phenomenon, I'm not sure it's so big here in the West, but when I grew up on the East Coast, uh, one of the, among the many things that, you know, parents are, don't go outside, you're gonna get killed by the whatever, um, change from day to day. Now it's the Africanized bees, and last week it was, uh, but koi dogs were something mentioned over and over and over again. And, you know, it's, when we talk about speciation, and I'm glad you brought up that, that bit about boundaries. So when we talk about speciation, you know, one of the things that, uh, again, that we do in our culture and for good reason, this is how quantitative science takes place, but we, we delineate everything into these quanta. You know, so you, you, th this goes here, and this goes here, and this goes here. We do that with gender and sexuality. We do it with everything. Um, 
And, and the real world just doesn't really come that way. Uh, Richard Dawkins, for all that I dislike him for one or two personal reasons, uh, he would often get into these debates with Stephen Jay Gould, who was my, probably my favorite evolutionary biologist, but Gould was more often wrong. I just think he was a better person. But Dawkins invoked this, because uh, Gould was a speciesist, but Dawkins invoked this, um, this heuristic where, he, where you'd say, you know, imagine a pool, a swimming pool. And this side of the pool is 12 feet deep, and this side of the pool is two feet deep. At what point does it go from deep to shallow? And it's completely relative to, you know, if you're six feet tall, it's here. If it's four feet tall, it's here. If you're eight feet tall, it's here. And that's speciation. So when we talk about these species that, you know, this is a dog is a dog is a dog, and a cat is a cat is a cat. If you introduce the fourth dimension of time, they all sort of become the same anyway. Um, but even these, you know, with these, these species like the different, uh, the different species or subspecies of the Canis family, yes, coyotes are distinct from dogs, uh, but we have found that uh, some breeds especially of domesticated dogs breed uh, quite well, quite robustly with coyotes, and they're more than happy to do it. And this has become, a, boy, a real thing on the East Coast. The, I always thought it was an, an urban legend. It's not. Koi dogs are, are unique, uh, I think, to North America, but they're, they're growing. Their population is growing because, well, for, uh, largely for the same reason that populations of coyotes are growing. They're opportunists. Uh, and they, you know, a, an opportunist with uh, just a, a little bit more robustness that it gets from the, the Canis domesticus family, um, a little bit more familiarity with human things, it gives them e an even bigger advantage. Uh, so that's, yeah, so hybridization is, is something that's been really ramping up in the past several decades. Uh, as far as wolves though, I don't know. It's, the problem with wolf studies in North America is, uh, boy, we've done a great job of, of killing them off. And which again is a big part of the reason that coyotes have proliferate, uh, proliferated so much. You know, we've wiped out all these other apex predators, wolves and, and grizzly bears and mountain lions and so on throughout so much of America. Uh, they, they don't have this, this quirk that coyotes do where if you kill one, four more pop up. Um, and, and so efforts to eradicate them have been a bit more, shall we say, successful. So looking at their interactions longitudinally in terms of hybridization, if you ever get you know, wolf-coyote hybrids or communities where they're living and working together, it's harder to study that. Um, I will say in the, the Yellowstone study area, it varies from pack to pack. Uh, one anecdote I can give you, for example, is in the Lamar Valley. When the Lamar Valley was occupied by the, a pack that moved there from Slough Creek, they hated coyotes and they would routinely just take them out on site. Uh, they were offended by them. Um, and then when another pack uh, descending from, or sort of originating from an area called Druid Peak came and occupied for a long time, the Druid Peak pack occupied Lamar Valley, they were fine with them. They would, uh, they would even let coyotes come and eat off their kills and they wouldn't do anything about it because the alphas were more tolerant of coyotes. Uh, so even right there, just these two wolf packs, you have these night and day instances of, well, how, what do wolves think about coyotes? Well, it kind of varies from person to person. So that's a long way of saying that, yeah, that's another example of where these boundaries are, uh, uh, they can be misleading because coyote hybrids are, are, if they're not here yet, they'll be here soon. They're expo expanding out from the East Coast and they're doing quite well. Um, we have time for one more question. In the back. Very back. Hi. Um, I think you've touched on this a bit, but um, you talked about the vocalizations they make where they can communicate with each other. But I remember reading something, but I don't know that much about it, that like that the coyote has more variety of vocalizations of, of any other canine. Is that true or do you know about that? Ooh, tricky. I don't, well, I think you're right. I don't know the exact figures on that because I, don't, I just, I don't know the science quantitatively, but I've also run into, um, 
I've also run into at least anecdotal evidence in the literature that suggests they, that they have the greatest range of vocalizations of any dog, um, unless we breed one that can talk, which who knows. But because they can communicate things like we're chasing a rabbit or one of us is sick or stay away or no, it's friendly here, come. We are under attack. No, everything is safe. And they can recognize each other too. They can, you know, over vast, vast di distances, especially puppies and parents. Um, and one other thing they can do, I forgot about this, so thank you for bringing that up. They can throw their voices. It's insane. Like they can, they can make it sound like they're over there so that a rabbit runs right toward them, which is, which is wild to me. Um, so yeah, as far as I know, again, I don't have peer reviewed data to lean on, but I've also heard that and I've seen it in the literature, so it's probably true. They really are the song dogs. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I think I've got it. <laughs>